か Kevin Brown. Yeah, so thank you for the record. All, all commissioners are present. Thank you. Any uh, planning commission have any announcements? Any nope. announcements? Department announcements? Yes, I have a brief, uh, brief announcement. Uh, we've just been introduced here to uh, one of our newest hires at the uh, county RMA. I'd like to introduce uh, Linda Young who's here in the control panel box here. She's worked for San Benito County for four years and started with the county as an office assistant, moved up to an eligibility specialist. And now here she's uh, uh, slowly working her way up even higher, as she says. <laughs> um, she previously worked for the Stanford University for seven years. And she's uh, been a Hollister resident since 2015 and is uh, married with uh, three children. So welcome, thank you very much, Linda Young, and she's gonna help us with minutes and meeting organization um, out of the RMA department. Okay. Thank you, thank welcome. You. I have a couple, uh, uh, just a, another few uh, department announcements. As uh, just for your information, tomorrow we are convening an interagency review committee meeting that's uh, not with electeds or appointed officials in it, but uh, staff and land use agencies that come together and talk about some of the projects that are projects or the issues that are coming together in San Benito County and tomorrow is uh, kind of a project review and introduction of a uh, proposed 149 unit subdivision on 50 acres uh, down off um, Enterprise Road not too far where some of the existing construction is happening with the Brigantino and the um, Bennett Ranch, very close to that neighborhood. Um, also on the docket that night, we'll be um, introducing the interdepartmental review staff to uh, a proposal at the Suncoast Organic Bakery, who's uh, um, <coughs> gonna formalize their operations with the, with the use permit. And so we're gonna go through that review and introduce that to the interagency inter folks there. And on the third item, I just want to, and this is actually kind of a prelude to uh, our last discussion item at the end of the day. Um, county staff has need to convene an ad hoc committee um, very soon here for um, something that hasn't been implemented yet from the general plan, but our um, scenic corridor development standards. So we have provisions in the general plan that speaks about preserving scenic corridors and it enumerates where those are in the county. But what we haven't fleshed out through yet in an ordinance is what type of fence materials? How tall is it? How far back should it be? You know, should it look like a split rail fence or should it look like razor wire and concertina wire? <laughs> you know, we haven't gone through the aesthetic. And so um, staff, um, since it's kind of a policy and a community shaping thing, it's not really something where can staff says, oh, brick walls are gonna be appropriate for our scenic corridors. So what we're trying to do is we assemble um, a planning commissioner. Um, it might also be great for us to have a member from uh, a rural community to protect our rural community because the first incident, the first road we need direction on is actually Chittenton 129 as you head west of the 101 right in there. We're thinking about a, a COG member, maybe the RMA director, Caltrans since it's a highway, and of course a planner for support. So maybe by this evening or, or now, if uh, we could have a volunteer planning commissioner that might wanna help us think about what a 
design standard might be. So what I envision staff doing is presenting uh, photographs of the neighborhood and the Chittenden Road and 129 and kind of show you where, what people are doing and how things have been for many years. Maybe put some ideas in front of you on what a good fence or a bad fence may be and kind of narrow it down for, for that. So, so with the chair, this is a, you know, a department announcement, but I'd be, at, I'm looking for a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> I volunteer. We have a volunteer. So sayeth, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, were you volunteering as a, as a resident or as the planning commissioner? No, that's, no, I understand. Thank you very much. <laughs> It'd be very nice to have you aboard and uh, don't know quite the schedule of this, but um, thank you for your participation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all I have right now. Of course, I have the yeah. two discussion items this evening following the uh, public hearing items. Thank you. <coughs> have public comment. Oh, that's and it. I'm sorry, one more introduction, my bad. Mr. Mr. Ted Lopez has joined us with the RMA and serving in a code enforcement officer capacity. So he's got three badges underneath the, no, <laughs> underneath the, the, the trench coat. Um, did you want to introduce yourself and yeah, get? I just describe it. I do have uh, code enforcement. I'm the new code enforcement officer, but I am professionally trained and uh, educated as a Long Beach County, so I think it'll be a good first step for our serving as a code enforcement <coughs> officer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think so. Okay. Public comment. This is open to anybody that has wants to say anything that's not in the agenda. They have three minutes to speak on any item that's, as long as not in the agenda. If you w wish to speak on something, you're welcome to come to the podium. None. Okay. okay. Close public comment. Consent agenda. Acknowledgement. Of the certificates of posting. Everything okay? Adoption of the minutes from May. Current minus one set of minutes for last year that I still owe you. That goes back. But we, we've come a long way from uh, being 0 and 12. But I still, uh, by January, we'll. Uh, will be caught up with the min minutes from this meeting as well as the one backlog. And any comments no, no on comments. draft minutes for November? I, I move to adopt the meetings, meeting minutes from the May 2019 meeting and the November 2019 meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we go to public hearing. Item number two, permit number, I mean, use permit grading PLN 18. 004. Uh, Michael, is that yours? Uh, yes. Uh, 18004. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Michael Kelly, Associate Planner. And can you hear me okay? Because You know, it sounds a little weak. I'm wondering if we can turn up the volume or pull the microphone a little closer to you. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little hard here. I'm kind of short. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I'll lean closer to the microphone then. Okay, this is, as you said, uh, file PLN 18.0004. This is for the assisted care facility proposed, assisted care residences proposed for 3586 Airline Highway. And what is proposed is, as noted in the staff report, um, 195 um, beds for senior adults in 173 rooms with 30 employees in, uh, across multiple shifts in um, let me just be clear here in uh, 119 360 119,360 square feet um, it says different in the agenda but actually it's a little smaller and I'll get to that there were some um, there were uh, some changes to the design from the environmental review to present and I'll touch on that in a moment. But um, here we have the location, of course. It is uh, right outside, here's Ridgemark and here is the site uh, southeast of Hollister. 
and uh, up closer is 3586 Airline Highway alongside Airline Highway, Route 25. There's the uh, main entrance to Ridgemark, but it is um, outside Ridgemark, just adjacent to some of these properties. And this is a simulation of uh, th the um, current design for how how this um, this construction would look. I will say um, I'll <coughs> say right here what was proposed on this site in the at the time of the environmental review. This was going to be um, two buildings. Uh, and, and now it is one building with just about the same um, intensity, same scale, maybe slightly greater in this uh, building, this one building, but roughly um, the same as the building that was here. It's just that earlier there was a separate building here, but it, it is um, what it was going to be was uh, 180 residents in 155 rooms. Here it would be 195 residents in 173 rooms. It was actually it was actually a larger uh, floor area, despite fewer residents before. Now it's a smaller floor area with more residents, but it still has all the features with all the rooms and all the facilities for um, uh, ac activities like dining and uh, social activities. Um, and that is in the that is in the floor plan and site plan here, where you see that the, um, here's Highway 25, Airline Highway. Here is the access that leads um, back across. Um, there's a stream crossing here, and there is a loop drive here, and the main entrance would be right as you arrive with um, the residence rooms beyond that and common facilities up close to the entrance and also in the center. Um, just a closer view here. Uh, there's a dining facility here and common facilities here and uh, interior open area right here. Um, it's also a grading permit. So there would be uh, 18,700 cubic yards of material cut and 7,100 cubic yards of fill with some export, some uh, tree removal, although there's landscaping involved to uh, replace that uh, of, uh, uh, as proposed, 141 new trees and associated utilities like for uh, water and wastewater and stormwater drainage. To get back to that point of um, what's changed, um, in short, staff believes that the changes are not so substantive as to uh, make anything about the environmental <coughs> review invalid when it comes to the scale and design of, of the project. Um, as noted in the staff report, it used to have a kind of a more Mediterranean look, but this is more contemporary. It's mostly the same, uh, like I said, mostly the same height, mostly the same uh, two and three story building faces, but a little bit more three story in spots. And the, as I said, the entrance has moved from the far corner uh, over to the southwest uh, to the nearest side of the building as you enter. Um, to walk through the site as it is. Um, here, this is how it looks right now. When you pass Sunny Slope County Water District, uh, you, you see the, well, I think this is actually behind the Sunny Slope County Water District. Here's the access drive looking southward or southwestward. And uh, the, the footprint of the building would be up here. It's built to step into the slope. It's not all um, one flat site and not all one uh, <coughs> level building but um, stepped into the slope here. It crosses this stream and uh, there is some, there is discussion of course of this in the environmental document but I have a little more to add um, about that in a moment. <clears throat> uh, this is looking over toward Ralph's Drive and 
uh, newer development inside accessible from Ridgemark. Uh, so there is this residential area over here, and this building would be neighboring it. Uh, it has been for a number of years zoned for residential multiple, for multifamily residences. So it could perhaps have been proposed for that at some point in the past um, several years, but it hasn't. Uh, it is just now proposed for this um, special kind of housing that's uh, not exact, not independent units, but uh, but uh, assisted care living. And another view of the neighboring residents and the current residents. <laughs> uh, current residents. <laughs> The, the property right now is um, rural, uh, a, a residential of a rural type with just the one residence and uh, um, some, here are th these, here are these uh, goats and the horses that are there right now. So it's, um, it's just, it's a rural kind of a setting as it is right now. And these are along uh, Tyler Court, just to the west. So this is the west property line. <coughs> And uh, just looking back at more of the, the building footprint, which would be here and, uh, and parking up closer to here and the access leading to Highway 25 and Sunny Slope County Water District. Just looking back down the, the drive toward <coughs> the water district. Um, this was reviewed in um, a, an initial study and a mitigated negative declaration that was uh, routed over about the past month. And uh, the result of the initial study was mitigated negative declaration, which was to say that there are there would be no significant environmental impacts, given all the mitigations that are in the uh, that are in the document. Um, we received public comment during this period of about a month, and um, the comments that we received in writing came from public agencies. Uh, this went to the state. Uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, CDFW, and uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They had the most substantial comments, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, there was a comment from the uh, uh, Department of Toxic, toxic uh, Substances Control. Um, they, they had questions about uh, hazardous materials on the property, and uh, th there is a condition of uh, if there are going to be any, if there is going to be any use of hazardous materials, it will follow the existing program of what our environmental health division requires. Um, they were also concerned about uh, what hazardous materials might already be on the site, but um, staff acknowledges that it is this um, relatively light use of residential uh, use in a rural setting with just the um, the animals that you saw there. And then Caltrans just kind of acknowledged receipt of the document and uh, noted um, basic requirements of how to properly connect to the um, road. Nothing about needing any real expansion. The intersection as it is, they considered to be sufficient. But as for the, as for the question of while, um, of biological resources. Right now what I should do is hand you, there is a revision to the resolution. So just a moment, I'll give you that. You know, I'm gonna fill in while Mr. Kelly's preparing his, uh, handing out his materials there. I would just like to iterate that, um, you know, I started <coughs> the county in April of 2017 and the investors, Mr. Javid and, and Mr. Um, Mr. Wynn had already had some preliminary designs on the table for an assisted care facility here. <coughs> and we're really fleshing out with the RMA uh, what kind of a design would work and what kind of a layout. And some of the initial comments that we had back from the fire department wanted um, a road and a full access to circle the property that hadn't been in one of the initial designs. And also, with the building that road as they kind of stepped and integrated it more into the site. And so I just want to iterate that the project's really been well vetted through the planning department. We've found uh, the consistency with the general plan and that it's an appropriate mix of residential multiple uses that can be permitted in, in this location by the, by the planning commission. The details that Mr. 
um, Kelly's about to go into, maybe we don't need to be so extensive, but um, maybe I can encapsulate them a little bit, Michael, with your permission, is the environmental document that was prepared that supports an action by the Planning Commission was a snapshot of, a, of, of the project in, in, in time. And since that time, there's been two significant cha two changes that we found are not significant environmentally, but kind of changed the project a little bit. One is the, um, instead of the two structures, it's become a single structure. They've added a few beds, but yet we still feel it's within the realm of what the environmental review covered and looked at. And the other was that uh, at the end, there was an architectural design change, so more of an aesthetic, not an intensity of land use, or they're gonna build it on the hillside instead of on the flat area. It wasn't a significant change like that, it was a cosmetic change. And with the changes that Mr. Kelly may go through, maybe we don't have to do excruciating detail, but the, the Fish and Wildlife Services basically looked at the environmental document, and they saw that we had identified potential impacts to um, red-legged frog, the, 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 which, which is the, which bat is it? Well, it's, it's not the bat that's the change, but it is, uh, it's- Red um, tiger salamander. Tiger, it's aquatic, aquatic. habitat-seeking species, okay. plus burrowing owl. And the burrowing owl, that's what it was. I knew it was something flying. Sorry, bats and owls, I'm sorry, that's mm -hmm. quite, quite the miss. All right, but basically the environmental document um, if you've missed identifying what a potential impact was and you haven't disclosed it, that's kind of a big deal where we have to go back and reload and let the public agencies and, and the public know that, oh, here's something we forgot to identify with an impact. That's not the case here. We identify there's potential impact to these three species, but the Fish and Wildlife Services, U.S. and state, have identified that there are better mitigation measures then we're in the documents in front of you that we can implement. And so Mr. Kelly was gonna go through a little technical exercise here, and I hope to, since we have other items on the docket tonight, not spend too much, but there's a formality of um, findings in CEQA when you add an equivalent or an improved mitigation measure to mitigate an identified potential impact. When you add new measures that weren't in the public realm, previously, but they're introduced now, um, that can be done at this hearing as long as we make some findings. And so the, ident the resolution with the red lines that are in front of you just shows the new mitigation measures and also the findings that the Planning Commission would make that basically state that these are, um, we knew there was the potential, but we've got a better and a more appropriate mitigation measure here, one that's gonna satisfy the Fish and Wildlife Service and Fish and yeah, they're both Fish and Wildlife Service now yeah. as we go forward. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of it simplistically. I don't necessarily want to drag everybody through that a little bit more. But sure. the, from the resolution that was in your packet, we, the, the one that we will ask for the chairman, if, if, should you vote to approve this this evening, will look a little, li little bit different. Right, yeah, and for a summary, really it is the new CEQA Finding 5 that tells you just really what it is. There are details, of <coughs> course, later on, and you'll see it in red-lined text, but um, burrowing owl, California tiger salamander, California red-legged frog, southwestern pond turtle, and western spadefoot toad, and also the stream bed, um, the condition of the, the stream bed, the, the two, the state and federal agencies each had concerns about how best to handle those. In the case of, in the case of the aquatic seeking, um, hi, aquatic habitat seeking species, the, uh, the amphibians, they, uh, what was recommended by the agencies was that um, more prior to disturbance of the site, more um, observation be done to, um, to be certain about the presence <coughs> or lack thereof of these species so that they are not harmed as a part of this project. So the finding talks about that and the mitigations reflect that and staff believes that 
this is adequate for the purposes of CEQA. And uh, the burrowing owl mitigation was already in there, but it's been modified. Same thing <coughs> for the stream bed alteration, the question of that action, since the drive crosses the stream bed and that has to be done properly. I mean, there is already the drive there, but it, um, if it's going to if it's going to be intensified use, it needs to be considered. So um, then new mitigation on these aquatic species. So um, what, let's see, this is a housing type that is for, uh, it is for an older population and the general plan has a number of policies in the housing element that encourage housing for people with um, special needs, including people who might need the services of this kind of a, of this kind of a development. And um, so um, included in the findings of uh, our recommendation, it, it cites that as a basis for um, recommending this project. And um, there is landscaping proposed to uh, try to create harmony with the area and um, address the um, question of aesthetics and visual impacts. Um, and, and overall, um, the conditions of approval, uh, the staff mm -hmm. believes it addresses the project issues uh, and I would say that um, if if you'd like to hear it, I also there are also um, details about how the uh, operation day to day of this would happen. That might be a little bit longer, but if you'd like to hear that, um, I can say that. But in short, staff recommends approval of this project with the um, modifications to the resolution. Let me get the text in front of me. Okay, staff recommends that the Planning Commission review the staff report and the initial study mitigated negative declaration, hold a public hearing, hear any proponents and opponents of the proposed project, and further recommends that the Commission adopt the resolution as modified, as presented to you, to adopt the initial study mitigated negative declaration and approve the project subject to the findings and conditions of approval included within the resolution, including the changes that are noted, and I can answer questions and commissioners. Any questions? <coughs> right now. Okay, we'll open up to public comment. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, okay. I noted that there were 17 trees going to be taken. Yes. And uh, 141 new plants, new trees planted. And so it sounds like there's going to be quite an extensive um, uh, landscaping. That's right. And does that include, I don't see it here, but um, some good park facilities for these people on site since they are not really mobile? I think the uh, applicant could speak to that pretty yeah. well, but I think the interior courtyard as well as the drive around, um, but maybe access to other areas as well for walking and things. Uh, were you looking for a direct connection to a public park? No, because uh, I don't think the population necessarily would be looking at that. <coughs> However, the open space environment outside of looking at walls yeah. uh, is uh, uh, pretty vital for that age population. Yeah. And to have uh, uh, area where there are walking paths, uh, especially along the little uh, creek that's going to be uh, facilitated or maintained, it would seem wise and healthy for that type of environment. That's why I thought I would see that here. Again, I think the applicant can probably speak to that as well as the operations, visitors coming and going, medicines, hours, if mm -hmm. you need to hear from about those items. Thank you. Commissioner, any more questions? 
Okay, we'll open up the public hearing. Any comment cards? Okay. We're going to hear from the applicants, the, from the project proponent first, I believe. Oh, you have, oh the project proponent. Okay. Pro, the project proponent first before the oh. public. We want to hear from the project proponent first. Project proponent okay. Is he here? Oh. M Mr. Kelly, uh, Matt Kelly. Oh, Matt Kelly. Okay. Thank you. I, I didn't mean to interrupt anybody. I just wanted to get my card in <laughs> in time. Um, my name is Matt Kelly. I'm the engineer for the project, and I'm representing the applicants tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here, and I want to thank Michael for his presentation and for his um, thorough preparation of the staff report. I, I hope you all had an opportunity to, to read the staff report because there's quite a few important details in there um, that weren't mentioned tonight. Um, I'd like to highlight a couple of them. One is the, um, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the rendering, I think it's a, it's a much nicer visual much than, than the, than the grading line, plan. Oh, thank line. you. Yeah, let's see. Uh, thank yeah, you. Here we go. Um, one of the highlights that I felt important based on the, um, comparing the old plan to the new plan is the relocation of the entrance. Originally, the entrance was uh, much closer to, to Ralph's Drive, and now the entrance is, um, opposite uh, Ralph's Drive over here on the um, eastern side of the project versus the, versus the western side. Um, another change that I wanted to bring up is um, actually a redu reduction in the footprint um, has an overall reduction in the, in the grading and the impact um, to the property, also eliminating um, one of the buildings. Um, a lot of times uh, when something like this goes up, any, any kind of development actually, people wonder about the, the impact to traffic and that was not addressed uh, yet. Uh, I'd like to read a, a segment from the traffic report and it reads, um, the signal warrant analysis, because the two intersections of concern here would be Fairview and Airline Highway and Airline Highway and Union Road. The signal warrant analysis for the Airline Highway and Fairview Road intersection would not warrant installation of signal control under the existing plus project conditions. In addition, the peak hour traffic volumes on the stop sign controlled approach at the Airline Highway and Project Access Road intersection would be below the minimum peak hour. Therefore, the project traffic will not significantly impact the existing peak hour operations. Um, sorry for the technical language, but what he's saying is the pro th this project does not impact either the intersection at Airline and Fairview or the one at Union. However, if you read the traffic report on the cumulative conditions, they take into consideration other projects that are in the area um, that are not yet approved, but you'll, you either already heard of them or you will be hearing of them soon because applications are already into the county. Those projects together do have an impact and they do warrant a signal at Airline and Fairview. However, they do so without even considering this project. So this project really has, has no traffic impact on those intersections. And the impacts that we're usually looking for are delays. It, it, it's, it's delays causing people to wait longer at an intersection than <coughs> they normally would expect to. Um, let's see. Some other highlights I wanted to bring up from Michael's staff report. Um, he did point out that the design is more contemporary. Um, another significant thing I thought that Michael brought up is the project site's residential multiple zoning and the intensity allows it predates the westerly residence development. That might sound might not sound like much, but um, I helped Mr. Javid rezone this property to residential multiple about 12 years ago. So someone moving into the area afterwards, if they had the wherewithal, they could go to the county, find out what it was zoned, and find out what kind of development would be proposed in an RM zoning, and they would be aware of um, changes to their neighbor. Um, sometimes people move in and they think, it's nice having a little country home and goats and horses next door. I hope it's like that forever. 
Uh, unfortunately, that usually isn't the case. Um, I think Michael did point out that the new design is functionally equivalent to the earlier design and creates no greater impact. Um, also wanted to point out that um, conditions of approval require, would regulate the aesthetics of the building, uh, including conformance to proposed design and, and the landscaping plan. Um, I didn't know that Marie Moda was going to be here tonight. She did ask me to mention that, oh, I'm sorry, Michael, that's your stuff. She did ask me to mention that Mr. Wynn and Mr. Javid and I met with her a couple of days ago. Her two main concerns were access to her property and the color scheme of the, of the building. I, we all assured her her access to her property will not be um, taken away or interfered with or changed. We are required to widen the driveway um, to accommodate an increased amount of traffic. Um, and um, Mr. Wynn assured her that the um, contemporary and somewhat, um, what would you call it, uh, trendy color scheme that you see here can be substituted for uh, a more earth tone uh, palette that might be more conducive to um, a county atmosphere versus, versus a downtown setting. Um, I think those were your main concerns. And um, um, I think that's all I have to say tonight. Um, the applicants are acceptance of the conditions of approval and the mitigation measures, and they appreciate your consideration for approval tonight. If there are any other questions, I'm, I'm available. Thank you, Matt. Thank no. you. <coughs> okay, public comment is open now. <coughs> As been stated, my name is Marie Moda. The address of your project is 3586, I believe. My address is 3588. And in the original pictures that you saw of the rustic and the farmland, that driveway, that was the roadway going up there, is my driveway. And that was my concern when I met with the developers. Um, we feel, my children and I, who, as you see, I'm aging and the land eventually will go to them. Those who don't know, but if you look at the pictures, right behind they have a structure going up where the road ends. It, it doesn't look like my house, but that's <laughs> supposed to be, I imagine, my house, and I have two residents up there. So where the road ends, where those uh, four structures are, is where my property is, and I have 10.4 acres there. Um, right now, I don't ever want to develop it, but. I, I want to protect my land for the future, and, and I, uh, in meeting with the developers, uh, all the houses, we border Joe's Lane, they are earth tones, <coughs> and of course I'm glad that the colors were brought up, and the colors of, if you look at the picture, um, there's blues and oranges, and I just don't feel that those colors would go with the setting. Uh, you know, it's still a rustic setting, it, it's farmland, Ralph's Lane is on the other side, and they're all earth tone colors. So I just want it noted that, you know, I object to the colors, but the de developers offered to change it for me. So that there, if you look at the pictures, there's blues up there, and I just don't think that's the, the setting for it. The other um, problem that we had is that I have a 30-foot easement going through that property. And that's where the existing roadway is now. It has to be realigned. I've been told that it's not really according to the description on it, but in the old days, you put the road in, and then they drew up the description. I have lived up there for 50 years. I've owned the property a little bit longer than that. So I have seen the horses and cattle, and now I'm seeing development. But you have to go along with change. So I do go along with the change. I just want it to fit with the, with the setting, and I just want it to go on the record that um, we feel that the road should be wide enough going up the hill to warrant what traffic it is going to generate. We have, um, we have quite a few cars, even up at my residence. I mean, there must be eight vehicles going up and down that hill, 
and right now there is a residence on the property and they have they must have a half a dozen or more cars and we still have a problem uh, nobody seems to want to stop you know when they think they have the right of way there's a stop sign if you look at your pictures at the lower uh, right hand side that pavement there is Sunny Slope Water Company's parking lot and they do have a stop sign there coming out but many times as I cruise off the hill where you see a car going up, those, the customers of Sunny Slope don't see that stop sign and they don't stop. So I'm, I just wanna be sure that the roadway is wide enough access out to the airline because they do generate quite a few traffic in there. The people are coming in, there's a drop off for paying their bills and they just go in and drop off their bills. There's a drop off box in the back of that parking lot and then they turn around and go back out. So that was my two concerns, and other than that, I just wanted it noted. So thank you. Thank you. Any more speakers? Okay. Close public comment, bring it back to the commission. Commissioners, any questions? No, ma'am? No. So do we get a motion, do we hear a motion? I move uh, that we approve. Okay. <laughs> yes? Okay. A resolution on the San Benito County Planning Commission approving San uh, County Planning File PLN 180004, a use permit and grading uh, permit to establish an assisted care living development on a seven acre project site. Resolution 2019. Next. Next. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we go to our use permit. PLN 18-0035, Sunny Slope uh, Christian Center Assembly. Michael Kelly. Yes, uh, Sunny Slope Christian Center proposal, uh, 18, uh, PLN 18-0035-1520, Sunny Slope Road. It is um, 12,437 square foot church sanctuary building that would be a new location on the site physical expansion of what's on the site, but uh, not so much an expansion of the actual use, more of a moving of the use from uh, one part of the property from the existing building to another. Um, here it, it is in um, right up close to, right on, City of Hollister boundary. And uh, there it is up close where you see the existing buildings as they are right now and the parking and then this land which is open is the site of the new uh, proposed building and here is the site plan with the uh, here now you're looking oops now you're looking with uh, north is to the left south to the right there here's sunny slope road and here is the access and the parking and, and the existing buildings and then new building at the rear over here and so it is proposed to have additional additional parking, reflecting that uh, there is the function of the church activity would be moving from uh, this building, the fellowship hall, to the new sanctuary building. It would be larger. It would be um, it would accommodate more people, but the function would uh, it would it wouldn't be. Simultaneous activities. It would be uh, it would be moving the activities from one side to another, but with somewhat more capacity and with uh, with more parking spaces there to serve that um, and some grading that's uh, minor to um, allow for this building to happen. Here is some depiction of the architecture. <coughs> with uh, the building being 34 feet tall, and then um, the tower here, 
And this is look. This is the view f that you would see as you approach it from the street and from the uh, by the existing buildings, the front, south elevation, and just an example of the side. This is if you were go going around to the left side on the west, you would see this. And uh, just to look more closely, this building would have multiple levels inside it with seating on the multiple levels, kind of auditorium style, with. Uh, um, here is the front, and here are the seats back here. Uh, inside, it's proposed to have, um, where it's not the actual sanctuary, it's proposed to have um, offices and uh, nursery, small cafe, and storage and bathroom and uh, related, related features. And it is in, as I said, um, more or less a pocket of the city of Hollister, unincorporated. Uh, but it would connect to, it would connect to, um, to uh, city wastewater services with some new wastewater infrastructure and um, connection to Sunny Slope County Water District water also. Mr. Um, Mr. Yeah. Kelly, the the colors that are laid on that aerial are not really coming through a little bit. Could you use your cursor to shape the city limit line that's on the west and north, and just kind of show yeah. us some of the the lines here, please? Yeah, the um, the black lines there that represent the property lines uh, over here. That is the city limit line, and here is just the east property line. So so the purple here. That is uh, city over here, county over here, and then uh, and then that's w that's county line. So county is here and on the project site. So that piece right there is the furthest west county piece nestled up to the city limit line. At least in this part. Uh, pardon me. At least in this part, like uh, Bonnie View Road over here is more. Oh, that's another county pocket more right there. Pockets interspersed. Mm -hmm as is the <coughs> kind of nature of this side of town. Thank you. <coughs> but the planning, it, it takes into consideration uh, city concerns. City of Hollister staff has looked at this a couple of times and given um, their recommendations on it, uh, including the connection to city services and also um, their concerns about the road improvements and dedication and improvements out in front on Sunny Slope Road to um, have it be to city standards and have it look like what's in the city over here. And uh, I can go into more detail about that, but um, this was reviewed under CEQA, again, another mitigated negative declaration document, initial study that was circulated in late November, early December with opportunity for public comment on this. Um, it, I, the document identified no significant environmental impacts it is inward development, pretty much. It's um, kind of light on that. Uh, the main concern um, seemed to be the, the traffic, and that was um, addressed by, uh, by the uh, document and by the design also. Um, and so we received, let's see, just a moment. Um, we received some public comment um, what I met, might mention from the project applicant, first I'll mention there was um, a neighborhood concerns about uh, noise and the parking area that was addressed in the staff report to um, say that conditions of approval address the um, question of noise and the design uh, was addressed in the parking area discussed in the staff report. The other, uh, there was, I received a question about the sewer system connection design and that was easily answered by the, uh, just referring to the site plan, um, a new connection to uh, the sewer line that runs in uh, Sunny Slope Road. And then there is the concern uh, that I mentioned from the applicant that's included in your packet uh, about, th about the road improvements and the necessity of the road improvements at this time. Staff believes that it is uh, warranted at this moment for the, um, the setting, 
and the, the history of this property, which was subject to a deferred improvement agreement in um, a much earlier permit. And that typically happens when if there's going to be more development on a site, then the uh, road improvements w uh, requirements will come into effect. And, and we're at this point at this time. But it's there for uh, you to consider. And, um, and uh, there is also an intermediate proposal that we can discuss that has um, somewhat, it has improvements in a way, but um, uh, it is using just entirely the existing pavement uh, with new striping to uh, channel traffic into turn lanes. So that's a possibility. But let me just go to another couple of points. Um, there is discussion in the staff report about aesthetics. Uh, one part was a mention of the could be potentially an imposing rear wall of the property, and there is a condition that uh, asks there for some more landscaping to screen that. Um, because it backs up to single family residences and it is 34 feet tall with not a lot of features. So that is a feature in the conditions of approval. Um, the applicant proposed and also uh, staff concurred and uh, included in the conditions of approval uh, kind of a maximum capacity of, if you remember the number right, I believe it's uh, 750 people on the site at any time when there are activities going on in the church sanctuary, uh, which has a capacity that's less than that, 600, um, 600 uh, something, 678 people. So uh, maximum capacity on the site of uh, 700, actually 748 <coughs> people, if there are activities happening in the other buildings at the same time. And so I, I'll say, I'll just make the recommendation right now that staff recommends that the um, Planning Commission review the staff report and the initial study and uh, mitigated negative declaration, hold a public hearing and hear any proponents and opponents of the proposed project and further recommends adoption of the resolution that's in the packet to adopt the initial study made mitigated negative declaration and approve the project subject to the findings and conditions of approval found in the resolution. So before the complete handoff to the commission, if I could just wrap a few points here. <coughs> so yeah. staff has, has reviewed this project. We have had the outside initial study that's been reviewed. Staff has found that the um, uh, development standards and the setbacks and the size and the proportion of the project um, um, <coughs> are appropriate for the site and that there's the capacity for the traffic and the turning movements on the property. Um, what we haven't heard from are the neighbors yet. There might be some legitimate concerns we, uh, that they're expressed about adjacencies and noise that can be addressed this evening. But as far as the development standards, staff feels it's in order. What will be of discussion tonight, as you saw from the materials, is um, we're not exactly in sync here with the degree of improvement along the frontage road, along the frontage. As you see, the subdivision to the west, um, I don't know if we have that in aerial view, but uh, when that was put in so many years ago, the street right of way and the frontage was, you know, curb, gutter, sidewalk was put in adjacent to that subdivision. Well, right now, if, as, uh, as you're walking down the street and heading east, it looks like the church property is about 12, 12 or 13, 14 feet in there with the, with the power and the utility poles. Well, it's, it's expensive to underground utility poles. Um, and make curb and gutter improvements. And the applicants this evening will be presenting an alternative to having the full right of way being improved. At the staff level, and as we've looked in the general plan and the requirements, it's our obligation to present to you the recommendation to have those frontage improvements made at this time. Here's where the development is. If not now, then when? But also in the, in the packet and within the Planning Commission's discretion, is if you wanted to make modifications to those street improvements, um, that you have the leverage with some findings that public safety is still assured, et cetera, or that it's a reasonable design, that you can make modifications to that. 
And of course, even that is appealable to the supervisors for them to take into consideration some alternative. Um, Mr. Kelly was uh, busy this afternoon, but I did have the opportunity to sit with um, RMA Director Mavergenis this afternoon. And it may be that we, that the county has uh, potentially some monies available through PG&E for some um, undergrounding of utility poles and that potentially it could be used here. I think there's still a great amount of discretion that would be exercised by PG&E. It's not necessarily a blank purse or blank check that we have and say, let's use it here. Um, but I think there's concern about, um, even though they've been in place, that neighborhood hasn't, you know, that little corner hasn't changed for many years, but basically there's, there's gonna be poles in the middle of the road still. And so, the RMA director and staff were, were willing to engage as partners in trying to find additional financial resources to kind of help some of those power lines come down so that it looks as nice as what's in the city next door, all right? But also we recognize that um, the, the street standard that just kind of shows, what is the street standard there, Mike? Is it 84 or 60? What is the right of way? Uh, I think it is 84. 84, Trend well, the conditions are right, and so if you just chunk that, keep heading east into the rural areas where it narrows down, you know, it kind of looks like we're probably never going to go down to go as wide as 84 feet to the east, and maybe at one point will be a logical transition point where you get to that 84 foot wide width in the city area, and maybe it necks down across this property or just a little to the east. So. There's going to be discussion of that this evening. Uh, Mr. Alan Andrad is here to present an alternative striping and pavement program. And uh, I wish that we were in complete sync before coming into the meeting. But as a staff, we need to present an opportunity to require that full development. But it's within the Planning Commission's discretion to interchange, to entertain changes. And I think that's <coughs> what we're going to have a presentation from the um, applicant. Um, before hearing from some of the neighbors. And part of the applicant's presentation will be from Mr. Allen Andrade, who I think has some lines on a map and would like to present you an alternative frontage improvement. So thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly. Um, you weren't in, in some of the conversations I had, but I just needed to set that up for your discussion this evening. Thank you. <coughs> Alan? Your graphic, if you'd like me yeah, to switch to it. it. There we go. That works. Not the largest, but thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tavin. Um, thank you, commissioners, for taking the time to hear um, the the application today. Um, what was discussed kind of last minute with Mr. Mavergenes and Tavin was um, not putting not putting <coughs> the onus entirely on the church for the full widening of Sunny Slope Road. As Michael discussed, this is, you know, a church that's been in operation for throughout history here at this site. And what they're proposing and doing is putting a new uh, sanctuary on the site. They're not going to be operating two sanctuaries. It'll just be one. The congregation is the size that it is now, and it functions with relatively no impacts. And it will continue to do so in the new church with the ability to grow. So we'd like to mitigate, you know, the impact that is the ability to grow rather than doing full frontage improvements is providing some striping out there and channelization so that uh, traffic going through that corridor when the use is uh, occurring is delineated and kind of directed in a, in a more of a safe manner than it exists right now. Right now there's just a double yellow line down the center. The proposal there with the blue striping is to um, paint it up so that it's delineated such that traffic can get in and out and traffic going through in both directions on Sunny Slope is aware that someone may be turning in or turning out of that, that uh, new drive or the existing driveway. Um, that's just kind of setting it up that uh, the impact, will it'll grow a little bit um, over time, but as of right now, with no real problems being associated with the current operation, that it will be gradual and the striping will mitigate that increase, provide additional safety, et cetera. 
the staff report asked for a condition of approval for full frontage improvements to the 84 foot right of way that was mentioned, which means that the curve would line up with the curve that is um, adjacent to the subdivision at the intersection of Clearview Drive. That curve and gutter is at um, 32 feet from the center line. That's enough for uh, parking, two eastbound travel lanes, a median and two westbound travel lanes. To the east of the project, immediately to the east, you're now in county property that has a curb that is only at 20 feet. So a 12 foot difference, that's a full travel lane. Um, there's existing houses there. There's even more houses to the east that uh, are kind of along that alignment for a 20 foot from the center line curb and gutter. So the transition that Tavin mentioned you know, it probably makes sense to have it happen on this site at some point in time. The problem is the overhead utility lines. They're very costly to underground. And when Mr. Mavrignez proposed using Rule 20 funds and coordinating with PG&E to have that undergrounding occur, the church is willing to uh, make the transition in the curve from the 20-foot curve and gutter to the 32-foot occur along the project frontage, install that curb and gutter, and the associated pavement lighting. So what you end up with is a finished road that transitions from the curb that's at 20 to the curb that's at 32. You get uh, pavement widening to a certain extent and the ability to have sidewalk, et cetera, when it continues to the east. All that can occur if the power poles are not a part of the issue. So what the church would ask is that we could modify that condition for full frontage improvements to a 32 foot curb to a, a transition from the existing curves east and west, provided that the county is taking on the onus of removing the overhead utility lines. That can happen at any time. Um, what I have here is the power poles uh, remaining with the striping, which could be an interim condition until the poles are actually removed, at which time the church would go in and put in the improvements to make the transition in the curb and kind of finish off the frontage. That's really the crux of the issue. I think all the other issues um, with regard to developing the project were appropriately addressed in the staff report with uh, Michael Kelly's detailed uh, analysis and you know presentation is kind of superficial, but uh, we'll see if the neighborhood has any other comments that we'll take into consideration that you should take into consideration. And uh, with, with your take on it is uh, we'd like to see an approval and get forward with the project that's kind of been in the works for two years and start, you know, get to the point where we can get a improvement plans approved and break ground and, you know, have this church grow as the rest of the community has grown around it and fill in that blank space in between the curb and gutters. Um, I'm here for any questions that you might have. And uh, I think there's other, other parishioners of the church that will be willing to speak with regard to um, how important it is for them to, you know, grow on the site and accommodate the needs of the community as they have been in the history. Thank you. Commissioner, any questions? After this one, we'll ask Maybe after the public okay. comment. Okay. All of it for public comment. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chairman and, and rest of the committee members, members. My name is Michael Fry. I'm the one who uh, authored this report, put, had it put in your packet to read. Um, we are probably instrumental in creating the dispute over that frontage property. And I thank you for Mr. Andrade and of course the leaders of the planning and building department to kind of start to consider maybe other options, which we appreciate very, very much. <laughs> We are certainly members of this community, and we certainly do want to grow with the community at, at large, and we certainly want to work with our community <coughs> leaders in the improvement of our frontage. There's no doubt about that. Let me just take a moment and let, let these leaders uh, just do their work and their professionalism, okay? Let me just tell you a little bit about Sunny Slope Christian Center. 
Maybe you know where it's at. Maybe, maybe you don't. But Sunny Slope Christian Center was established here in our county and city in 1927. We have been, uh, we have moved in several locations at different times, starting with right down here by uh, by the little uh, the hill, um, little church there on um, what was the name? Of that? I'm forgetting the name of the street, but downtown Hollister. And we finally have moved up to uh, Sunny Slope Road, where we've been established since the early 1970s. Okay, now. We have now reached our 92nd year as a church in this community. Somebody, uh, Mr. Andretti, mentioned that we've been around for a long time. So God has been good to us, and we've been growing. Sunny Slope Christian Center has been involved in many of our community uh, uh, services. We help support the Emmaus House, the Chamberlains, homeless shelters by feeding them as well as even having church services with them we've also uh, had many thanks annually we have thanksgiving uh lunch for all of those who are less fortunate in our community it's all around in our, our our community right around our church we've served over 400 people just this year alone they come into our our facility we also have supported the um uh, maybe center on north side by having church services there we've also had outreaches at San Benito High School where our pastors go down there we are also a polling place for all of the elections they you you guys come to us and we love to have you okay and uh, of course you probably have heard of the little Baylor preschool so we provide a service for them also during the night <coughs> Uh, time's up. Uh, <laughs> just, just give me just that, another moment, and I'll be done real fast. Since I'm the project manager of the whole thing here. Uh, during the 1989 uh, Loma Prieta, we provide many services for the, for the city, for not only sleeping, but also feeding purposes. And our, um, our building, uh, trying to reach those in our public all the time. Sunday so Slope Christmas. Sunny Slope Christian Center will continue to be a bright lighthouse in our community. Okay? okay thank you. Thank you very much. Any more speakers? No? Bring them back to the staff. Um, commissioners, any questions? Uh, personally, uh, I have uh, heard about the Rule 28. Uh, about uh, the county having uh, like a savings account within PG&E that is uh, usable for uh, removing poles and doing underground. Uh, and I think that in this case, since, since this church, or any church, any good uh, service to the community uh, should get that kind of uh, help from the county in order to move those poles in there with their good intention of uh, providing a curb and gutter uh, or improving that frontage uh, in whatever time frame that the county should decide was good and right. But I think it's well worth investigating the uh, 20A funding for this project. That's what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Kevin, would you care for me to speak, or did you want to hear from more of your commissioners first? No, yes, I need. I'd like to hear your comments. No. Yeah, so there's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not like a, a checkbook, or you, you know, you pull one out a safe deposit box, and now you use it, and it's not that, that free of a discretionary use of money on the county's part. We have to meet, meet, and be part of the findings and the criteria that uh, the PG&E was set up for, and there might be you know, scenic qualities that, you know, in the landscape that need to be protected and or, you know, those rural transition areas. But um, it is the intent of the director that we leverage PG&E or these funds as best we can and see if we can apply them here. And it's, you know, it's not, a, it's not inexpensive to 
you know, take a poll down. And these poles don't just have, you know, a 200, you know, 110 volt line on them. If you see, there's, you know, looks like there's cable television, there might be internet, there's a, several, quite a few utilities in there. Um, and there's some, you know, bureaucracy in that to spend money. I think, that I believe it's a utility district where you're going to spend that money needs to be created. So there's some, a little bit of rigmarole, but um, what I'm seeing is a, is a willingness from the RMA and the county to engage and try to be as helpful as, 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 as we can there. And from the funds that might be available is, um, I think the director said, you know, if, if there's funds available that would still, you know, head, head east a little bit beyond the property, maybe we could do that as well. Um, so I can't, I do not have a dollar amount to quantify how much per poll it's costing for the waiver, how much money can guaranteed be available. Those are still crystal ball kind of items here. Um, so just again, you know, at the staff level, it's not for staff to make policy on when a requirement is applied or not. You know, that's kind of reserved for the supervisors and, and the discretion of the planning commission. So we've laid out a case for making the full improvements um, and, but also willingness to be, be a partner here. What I don't know is, you know, say all these funds are expended and we have a new project two years from now and someone says, well, you, you helped underground those poles. All right, so those are bigger elected type of questions that need to, that would be engaged. So that's, that's what I have right now. I do have some flyers on the PG&E Rule 20. Um, I've never applied it before or been well versed in that. I've just been reintroduced to it today. But even, even a year ago, the applicants did approach <coughs> us and with the project site being on the cusp of the city and eventually in the city limits and on the county, you know, are there, why, you know, why is it all on us here? You know, it's a county piece, it's a city piece. Can we, can we find a partnership in funding? So they've, they've certainly stay, stayed true to that voice in trying to find resources on what to do. Um, but I think also Ms. Andrade uh, pointed out that regardless of lines on a general plan map, it kind of looks like the natural section where you might neck things down from the 84 foot width on the west to that transition on the east because it doesn't, because there's those properties are, are developed because they're fronting on the street. It's not like we're going to take a road dedication right up to somebody's living room window, right? So in the potential that you might want to modify or entertain a change to um, condition number 14, um, I've drafted some rough language here that might meet your satisfaction if that becomes part of the discussion. So I'll, I will zip it at this point so I don't get a red card. And Not even bring them today. Oh, well, we were supposed to bring a red card. Oh, <coughs> it's a little playful way to <laughs> say stifle. <laughs> yeah. So back to you, Chairman. Thank you uh, very much. Commissioners, any, you want to see right now what, uh, number 14, what's the, do you have that recommendation in the, um, I can read it. It's not perfected. It was just done here on the fly, but currently 14 reads. Okay, here they are. Oh, got it. Mm -hmm. You want to find 14. Oh, I handed it to you. Mm -hmm. So currently 14 reads, uh, public works, road dedication improvements. Um, and also part of this request and requirement is coming from the city of Hollister because our general plan does defer to them and it is the city of Hollister standard for the street right of way. And the city Hollister has a um, game here in that they're also a service provider for the sewer and the water. They, they didn't have to, right? But they've offered their, those municipal services for the property and I think they were hoping for the frontage improvements. So I just need to say that. So number 14, road dedication improvements. The project shall dedicate, widen, and improve the frontage of Sunny Slope Road to city of Hollister standards to include sidewalk, curb, gutter, landscaping, and undergrounding of overhead utilities. It's a condition uh, jointly put together by the Public Works City of Hollister Development Services. So should the commission wish to modify that? Um, maybe it's too broad and Mr. Uh, Deputy Council Ellenwood could 
rein me back in, but let's try this one. Road dedication of improvements to the satisfaction of the City of Hollister and County of San Benito engineer to provide a logical transition from the western city edge to the county right-of-way on the east. The county shall make efforts to involve PG&E and use Rule 20 funding to assist in the undergrounding of utilities and poles fronting the property. So what I'm hearing right now in my own voice reading that is I don't have a timing component in there. Mm -hmm. No. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we may want to. I mean, a good mitigation measure, even if you want to be broad and inclusive <coughs> to the who, what, where, when, and why. <coughs> and so maybe through some dialogue here we can nail it. Okay. Um. Um, I would recommend that... I would recommend that the... Um, condition regarding the dedication of the right-of-way be uh, included as it exists. It's just the timing and the nature of the improvements um, and the efforts to be made to try and get some assistance for that uh, that uh, might be subject to some flexibility. But the dedication should occur so that um, it's consistent with uh, the city requirements. So let me translate, translate that if I could, which is easy. Um, right now, we, the, the, and the church is willing to dedicate the right of way to the public for the mm -hmm. street. So that means if we don't get around to the public improvements later, we do not have to consider a condemnation, an eminent domain or anything. The applicant's already given up the land for those public purposes. We just might not know what to do design-wise for a little while but it's good to get the dedication now and while we work out a design that's to the satisfaction of the city and the engineer. Uh, this, <coughs> the standard conditions for approval of a project <coughs> with street frontage that requires, you know, meeting standards would be for the applicant to pay for those uh, improvements. And um, the church is asking for flexibility in that. Um, that's the, ex however, it's the expectation of the city in making that request that the applicant pay for that. So that's, that's where the difficulty lies in the responsibility for the costs of the improvements, um, even if the dedication is there. A little confusing here. Sounds a little murky. It's a little, can we hear from the applicant? How, uh, this it says, put it in plain English. <laughs> so, so the discussion, you know, card, seems like it's trending towards some sort of uh, not the full improvements, but a little bit of something. Mm -hmm. What I'd offer is Tavin's um, language with um, the church taking the responsibility for the curb, gutter, sidewalk, and pavement widening to occur when the power lines are removed. So it can be a deferred improvement agreement in which curb gutter sidewalk and pavement widening will happen when the power lines are taken care of by another entity. Now, I wanted to you know, make a point that has always been in the back of my mind, but I haven't stated it outright. Maybe in the emails that I sent you, but um, putting the onus of uh, all these frontage costs and improvements on this project would be totally within the ordinance if it was a subdivision. The ordinance does call for full frontage improvements whenever you do a subdivision. This is not a subdivision. This is a use permit. And use permit, uh, kind of the threshold for requiring frontage improvements has to do with what's necessary for public safety. Public safety seems to be kind of at a, at a miss, you know, one right of way width uh, east of the project and another on the west. We agree to the uh, transition in making that happen. And the really only stumbling block is these large power lines that serve everyone in the county. You know, it, the power lines aren't there just to serve the church. They serve Santana Ranch. They serve all the Anderson homes that are off of Beverly Drive. These are big projects that uh, impact fees that were collected when those houses were built. 
should be appropriately applied and whether it's rule 20 and coordination with pg e a combination of you know funding sources from those <coughs> those approved projects that really yeah. created the need for having such a high power line use um, traffic etc um, willing to hear your elaboration or um, your consideration <coughs> of an amendment to mm -hmm. the condition 14 as written mm -hmm. along the lines of the deferral that I mentioned and uh, Tavin's language with regard to the transition between the two existing curbs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Reference to the language that we used to make a motion or are we just gonna restate it? Uh, you can make a motion. Uh, okay. I'd, I'd yeah. like to make a motion to accept Resolution 2019-NEXT <coughs> for PLN 180035, but however amending condition 14 to require dedication, however to make the widening and improvements to the City of Hollister standards contingent upon the county working with pg e for the undergrounding funds and to require the temporary striping scheme as presented by the applicant. I second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your deliberation. Mr. Andrade, if you would, th is that the same exhibit that uh, County Engineer and I have? Yep. Okay, th thank you. So what we'll do, Chairman, is we'll get the revised language and a resolution for your, for mm -hmm. your signature with these exhibits. All right, All right. thank you. <coughs> you guys wanna take a five minute break or continue? Okay, we'll take a five minute break. Thank you. <laughs> Eight. I wish I could pick up that one. Did you say you'd be able to, or are you just to we walk through the plan and you can have with the prior tables and the yeah. Sentinel photo? Yeah. Thank you. Did you need to? No, are you okay? No, I'm just fine.
You're up, Michael. I think we could probably make those out of paper up there, yeah? <coughs> make a selector. Oh. Ready? Okay. Continue the meeting. This is, this is muffled behind the first one. Item number five. And this PLN 19027 zone change use permit. Michael, is that yours again? Yes, once again. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, this is, as, uh, as you said, a use, it's, uh, a, it is a use permit and a zone change. A zone change to change the uh, property designation from what it is now, single family residential, um, but actually is, is a de facto matter uh, o open land to neighborhood commercial purposes. And uh, it is, it is, here in Ridgemark, and just looking closer, you see uh, Ridgemark all around it, and here is the site. Um, and just to get a view of how it is right now, Ridgemark Drive leading out to Airline Highway, um, Route 25, and um, what used to be tennis courts here, and the uh, town homes development on either side here, and then the central building there for Ridgemark. Um, and so the, the property that's involved here, well, we'll go to it right here. And uh, thanks, Ariel. <coughs> uh, like I said, right now it's R1, single family residential, but used for uh, open, open space right now. And uh, proposed neighborhood commercial. There was the earlier proposal that happened over here. It was um, proposed in 2017, and an earlier version was proposed in 2010 and 2011. It was approved both times. First, the rezoning was approved right here uh, uh, to commercial neighborhood. <coughs> and then a, a, a proposal for a single building of commercial that was over here uh, at this edge of the property, parking over here, that um, just didn't happen. 2017, the proposal came back to have the buildings placed in uh, different positions, which are, well, here it is. Uh, the, the earlier, this is called phase one, had um, about 20,000, right? Yeah, 20,000 square feet in three buildings plus a smaller building. And this proposes to um, have a kind of a continuation of the same idea uh, but on um, land that has that was not part of the earlier proposal um, that is now being proposed as an expansion to the existing neighborhood commercial zoning area. And the building is uh, just under 10,000 square feet over here with, with corresponding uh, parking and, and access and overflow parking. Because the earlier proposal had a concern at the time about um, would there be enough parking for the uh, existing uses in Ridgemark. And this addresses that with this overflow parking in addition to the parking that relates to the new commercial use. And uh, this, is the, this is an illustration of the building or uh, a, a version of the building. Um, or the, the type of scene you would see if you look at the proposed building as submitted by, as submitted by the applicant, um, this kind of architecture. And more on the architecture, these are elevations to, um, to show again the, the type of architecture. Um, it's, <coughs> it is, uh, Basically, it's the type of architecture that is proposed. 
if you go to the site right now uh, during the daytime, you would see this, uh, the, the open, uh, the parking lot, the um, office building, that's a house, and the tennis courts over this way. Uh, the, the parking lot again and the, um, the office building and then uh, the edge of the site as it is right now. Looking, if you're over by the trees, you look back and you see the parking lot over here and um, here are the Joe's Lane town homes. The development is proposed to come over this way. Um, there would be removal of trees, but there is a requirement that there be landscaping that replace that to uh, make up for the change. Again, just looking toward the site over here, um, it's not exactly, not much in the way of landscaping as it is in the current status uh, right now, other than this green over here. But again, Joe's Lane townhomes. Um, the project site is over here. This is looking back southward uh, at the open land where the development would be taking place, extending beyond these trees over in the direction of the viewer here. And uh, the, the, the tennis courts, just not in uh, much, if any, use at all as it is there. Another view of the tennis courts looking toward the um, townhomes to the south of the property. Um, this project was uh, reviewed under CEQA a little bit differently from the, the other projects. This is considered implementation of the general plan because it is right there at what the general plan calls a commercial neighborhood node, uh, which foresaw that there would be uh, this kind of land use, neighborhood serving commercial in this uh, location. Um, it's focused on Airline Highway and Ridgemark Drive and Fairview Road. This is, uh, staff believes that the, the, the situation at the actual intersection um, it's, it has its constraints, and this is um, an, a site that is reasonably reachable from that intersection and uh, serves the purpose of neighborhood commercial for um, people who are near that intersection, whether they be Ridgemark residents themselves or from outside the development. And this, this commercial development would be accessible from uh, the public roads, not inside the gate. In Bridge mark. Um, so, moving on. Um, it's, uh, like I said, neighborhood commercial use, and it would be uh, m mostly retail, uh, but some similar related services that serve the purpose of uh, people in the close by neighborhood. Uh, about, um, about two-thirds to three-quarters would be uh, retail, and there could possibly be about um, one-third or one-quarter of a uh, restaurant or food, something type, uh, something related to that, similar to that. And uh, it's not exactly spelled out right now, but the use permit would accommodate for that possibility that this would be part of that. And so I'll just say right now that staff recommends <coughs> that the Planning Commission review the staff report, hold a public hearing, and hear any proponents and opponents of the proposed project. And staff further recommends Planning Commission consider the resolution, including the um, uh, addendum that, link that considers this project as part of the general plan implementation. and. Uh, for the, the general plan and its environmental review foresaw this happening. So the, and, and the impacts have been already considered by that. And uh, so adopt the resolution to uh, adopt that addendum and also recommend the uh, uh, ordinance that would go to the board in order to make the rezoning happen if they choose. And um, so adopt the resolution subject to the findings and conditions of approval included therein to adopt the addendum, recommend the ordinance to the board, and approve the permit and zone change. And 
your questions. Just want to see where any questions. No. Uh, through the chair, uh, this is one of the economic zones that was cited in the general plan to be developed around the county. Correct. It is yes. It's commercial neighborhood note, and it. Uh, Propose that this sort sort of service be available within easy reach of people in the area, residents in the area, uh, rather than going to farther off places. Have those available for the population. And may I ask one thing? Um, when the phase one was approved, there was consideration for that uh, space behind that was more open. And uh, what was the reasoning? then not to expand or was it just difficult uh, to uh, get that implemented to have a larger space? You mean um, why, why did this current proposal not happen earlier? Mm -hmm. Is that it? It was just a, it was just, um, that was the project description at the time. It was the only available, it was the only available zoning at the time. There are ideas that are around and out there about maybe something further could happen. And actually, w we have an application in the office, in our office right now, for um, potential uh, several further lots in Ridgemark and some commercial use. But that is uh, nowhere near decided, and s or n nowhere close to being considered, as I understand it. Uh, so. Um, this is, that was just the proposal at the time, and this expands upon that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Michael. More questions for Michael? No. no. Okay, can we hear from the applicant? <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Gary Coates here on behalf of the applicant. and. I want to thank both Michael and Tavin and the, and the staff as a whole for taking us through this process and helping us get to the point where we are today. Uh, in answer to your question, uh, Commissioner, on the zoning or the issue, at the very original there was an approval that was already on the project from uh, JKM that was a 20,000 square foot commercial project. That project was something design-wise that no one really was fondly in favor of because it was fronted all with parking lots. Mm -hmm. So when you drove in, all you saw was parked cars <coughs> and nothing. We wanted to hide the cars, pull them into an interior location, put buildings so it became more of a community center, more of a community sh uh, s shopping and stopping area. So we did that in the first phase. We thought that the balance of the property, which you now have, was already zoned commercial. Unfortunately, that new section we're doing today was not zoned commercial. Uh, that's consistent with a settlement agreement that we have with the Homeowners Association that now completes that to be consistent with that as well as with the nodes that your staff has mentioned on the general plan. Yeah, that makes so sense. this is kind of a yeah. fill out situation <laughs> okay. to finish up. So um, I really don't have a lot to add. Your staff's done an excellent job. I'll answer questions if you have any questions. Uh, the conditions on there we know really relate to the first phase or just continued on, which were all acceptable to mm. us. So I'll conclude, Mr. Chairman, my comments and answer any questions you might have. Any, any questions? No. Nothing for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we open up public comment. Any speakers? No speakers? Okay. We'll close public comment. And commissioners? <coughs> move to support? Move yeah, to let's. So you move to support? Okay, with a motion yeah. to. <laughs> you have questions? No, it's no. A, um, ah. Commissioner Eglin with a. Oh. I move. Um, let's see that we. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, it's the resolution. Oh, oh that we enact. Uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Usually this is just. Ready to go. It's in my district. Do you want me to do it? I'd like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I make a motion to adopt the addendum to the San Benito County 2035 general plan for file PLN 190027 
and to adopt the resolution of the San Benito County Planning Commission recommending to the Board of Supervisors enactment of a zoning map amendment for neighborhood commercial C2 zoning and conditionally approving a use permit to establish neighborhood serving commercial development on an approximately two acre project site following consideration of County Planning File PLN 190027, Resolution 2019-NEXT. Wow. Wow. Good job. Can you add any more to it? No. Okay. <laughs> Do I hear a second? I move to second that. <laughs> All in favor? Na Navarro. Aye. Aye. Gibson Navarro. Aye. Thank you. Okay. So tell me, Robert. Okay. Uh, Dis well, to item number six, discussion. Yeah, well, with that, Chairman, that uh, concludes the public hearing elements of the <laughs> evening <laughs> and uh, brings us to a discussion item where we had a request to receive a presentation from Stephen Blum, president of TELUS Venture Associates regarding uh, the broadband consortium. So I'd like to um, maybe, Mr. Kelly, you could help find his PowerPoint and okay. call that up. and. Um, so, M Mr. Gibson, I don't know if you, uh, or excuse me, Chair, uh, Commissioner okay. Gibson, did you want to, uh, through the chair, introduce uh, your interest in having this uh, subject discussed uh, at the Planning Commission? Sure. <coughs> through the chair. I, I just think it's important that uh, in order for the county to maximize our commercial development that we need to have the infrastructure in place, and uh, this group has been working that way, but I think that we need to have a public forum and get more people involved, in particular the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission, uh, to uh, get broadband infrastructure throughout the, uh, the county, especially the north end of the county. So, and I, I appreciate your coming to uh, present to us. Well, thank you. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad there's people interested in this. It's uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, Central Coast Broadband Consortium was formed about 25 years ago, originally by uh, AMBAG, um, but then it kind of split off and became its own entity and was rebooted about 12 years ago um, as we were uh, ramping up to uh, make proposals for the uh, stimulus program back in 2009 and, and uh, 2010. Um, those proposals, uh, as I'll get into, uh, did uh, did turn into uh, they were they were turned down a couple of times, and then we came back with some uh, with some partial ideas, and uh, slowly but sl slowly but surely, those uh, those projects are are starting to happen. Um, the County of San Benito has been a participant in the Central Coast Broadband Consortium uh, since the very beginning. Um, City of San Juan Batista, City of Hollister, also participates. It's an ad hoc group that takes in the uh, cities and counties uh, from the, uh, the three county region, uh, San Benito, Monterey, and Santa Cruz counties, as well as major educational institutions like UC Santa Cruz and uh, Cal State Monterey Bay, um, uh, private internet service providers, and uh, companies that are involved, uh, companies and other organizations that are involved in high tech and, uh, and uh, related fields. Um, I was asked to sort of start out with kind of a broadband 101. And broadband is really about speeds. I think when, if you're trying to boil it down to a single metric, it's how fast you can get stuff to come down to you from the internet and how fast you can send stuff up. Download speeds and upload speeds. And those speeds range um, widely over, not just, I mean, in San Benito County, but widely over the region and throughout California. Um, if you're talking about what we used to do 20, 25 years ago, you know, you've got mail, that's <laughs> down around the, the one megabit or less level. That was, uh, it was pretty easy back then. Facebook, um, that lives pretty well at about 10 megabits, which is what uh, halfway decent AT&T DSL service will get you. It's not the great, it's not the real good stuff, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's stuff that at least they've, uh, they've, they've managed to improve up to minimal standards. If you want to watch Netflix, 
25 megabits is what they recommend if you want to watch one high definition stream. If you want to watch two or three high definition streams, you start to multiply that, uh, that figure. You get up into the 100 megabit range, and that's where kids are doing homework, uploading videos, watching, uh, watching stuff online. Um, that's where business is transacted, um, where companies are, uh, are, are communicating with people all around. You get up to the gigabit range, and that's, that's what Amazon does. Um, that's uh, that's high-grade uh, industrial strength internet service. Now there's um, gigabit level residential service available and even and gigabit uh, grade uh, service that's available to businesses, small and medium businesses as well. Um, whether people actually make use of that, all that capacity right now is, is open to question, but um, what I don't think is open to question is over the long term, that's the direction we're heading. Um, you know, as I said, you know, 20 years ago, you have got mail and you thought you didn't even need a megabit for that. Um, it's, it's, it's moved on since then. In California, the state legislature has set a minimum standard, and that's six, six megabits down, one megabit up. That's somewhere between AOL and Facebook uh, grade service. Um, Federal Communications Commission um, says the minimum, um, the minimum that, uh, that, that people need these days is 10 megabits down, one megabit up. That's the speed level that they're subsidizing right now in, uh, well, in parts of San Benito County, but uh, throughout rural America. Um, on the other hand, the, the, the Agriculture Department, USDA, who really does work with and develop, does a lot of development wor work in uh, is responsible for rural America in a lot of ways, says that no, what you really need is at least 25 megabits down, three megabits up, that you need to be able to, you need internet service that's good enough to watch Netflix, not that that's what you're necessarily gonna be using it for. Um, if you look at what people are doing in, in uh, ag tech um, or just in normal agricultural operations these days, 25 megabits down is, uh, is, is, is just barely making it. Three megabits up is, not very fast if you have to get it, a lot of information to somebody in a hurry. Um, 100 megabits down, 20 megabits up, that's a standard that um, uh, FCC Commissioner Jos Jessica Rosenworcel has put forward as the homework standard, that that's what kids need, uh, need to do homework these days. And then there's also another tier, the, the gigabit tier, um, right now, that's not really set as a standard for anybody, but uh, it's, uh, it, is, it is where we're heading. One of the questions we had, though, as, as a consortium and, as, and the policymakers and, uh, and staff that are, that are involved with the consortium had is what should our standard be in this region? There's a lot of different organizations that are saying, well, it should be this standard or that standard. Well, we were, asked, we were asking ourselves, what's appropriate here? So um, the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership and Central Coast Broadband Consortium partnered on a study. Um, we s did surveys of people in all three counties, North County, South County, um, rural areas, urban areas. We started out with the assumption, I call it a hypothesis because it sounds more impressive, um, but we started out with the assumption that we were going to get different answers based on where people were. That s a software developer up in Santa Cruz was going to need some, something different than a, you know, a homeowner in Hollister. Um, turned out we were wrong. We disproved the, ho the hypothesis. hypothesis. We, can, we could declare the, the experiment a success. We achieved a result. Um, it didn't matter where people lived. It didn't matter what people did for a living. It didn't matter where their kids went to school or even if they had kids. The number that came back to us was 100 megabits down, 20 megabits up, um, would take care of everybody's needs, um, everybody's residential needs. It would take care of most business needs, small and medium sized businesses. Once you start getting uh, up into larger sized businesses, they need, uh, they need more robust internet access. But if you're looking for a general standard, what everybody agreed on was 100 megabits down, 20 megabits up. 
And when we started diving into it, 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 it really made sense that you might have a rancher down in Bitterwater um, who is conducting business on the internet, and you might have a software developer up in Santa Cruz who's doing business on the internet. They are using the same tools. They're using the same online tools to communicate, um, the same online tools to get information. They're using the same service platforms, accounting packages, um, compliance packages. They're, they're going to the same types of websites. They're doing the same things online. Their kids are doing the same homework. Um, their families are watching the same videos on TV and, and playing the same games online. So it's, it's, it, it really didn't matter where people lived. We came down to um, a standard of 100 megabits down, 20 megabits up. And that's what the CCBC, as an ad hoc regional organization, um, said this is a standard that we think that uh, we ought to be pushing for in our region. That when, we're, that when we're looking to develop broadband infrastructure and broadband service, this is the minimum standard we should be aiming at. And we've had a number of cities um, around, cities uh, mostly uh, around the region adopt this. Um, we've had good, uh, good discussions with folks at both in Monterey County and in uh, Santa Cruz County about this. Um, we've also had uh, really good feedback from, uh, from county staff here in San Benito. Um, we want to push this as a standard so that we sit down to talk about what's acceptable when you we're sitting down to talk with internet service providers about what's acceptable or what is needed and why we need to do things, um, that this standard, um, we, th we think this standard is good for now and good for the, good for our planning horizon, which is five to 10 years, um, keeping in mind that Five to ten years from now, we might be talking about a different standard, but right now, um, we think we know where we ought to be. So the question is, where are we? Where is San Benito County? Where is, is the Central Coast region? One of the things we do as a consortium, we have a, a grant from the California Public Utilities Commission to do um, broadband mapping, broadband data analysis. And I won't go into all the geeky details of it, but if anybody wants me to talk, wants to talk to me about it, I, I love to talk about this stuff. Um, we take data that is uh, service reports that is provided by the carriers um, in San Benito County. That is principally AT&T and Charter Communications in the north, and then Pinnacle's Telephone Company in the south. We take that information. Um, and we do a couple things with it. The first thing we do with it is, is try to figure out where the gaps are. So what you're seeing up on this map is some white areas and some colored areas, um, and those colors, uh, and then some gray areas. The gray areas are areas that are uh, considered to be uninhabited, um, the, or at least classified that way. I, I don't think that's completely correct in a lot of cases, but. Those aren't, uh, those, are, those are, as the census data shows those to be uninhabited, or at least no residences. Um, but you're seeing, otherwise you're seeing white areas and colored areas. The white areas are, in this map, are areas where you can get service at the California state standard of six megabits down, one megabit up. The colored areas are areas where you can't. And then the color coding tells you is color coded by heat, by population. You can call this a heat map. In other words, where you see red, that is where you have a high concentration of people using rural uh, population levels, population density levels as, as, uh, as benchmarks. Where you have red, you have high concentrations of people who don't have access to that level of service. Where you have green, um, it's not so populated, you don't have as many people um, per square mile um, who, are, who are lacking. The reason we do it this way is that um, Population density um, is a key factor when you're trying to talk internet service providers into coming in and expanding uh, broadband service, whether it's the incumbents like Charter and AT&T or, uh, or if it's new, uh, new companies, you want to be able to say, hey, this is, this is an area where there are a lot of customers who need broadband, and then you start to work with them and you say, well, once you've got that core built, you try to build out into the uh, into the green areas. So this is it. At, this is what it looks like at six megabits down and one megabit up. 
when you change it to 10 megabits down, one megabit up, the map doesn't change very much. Um, there's a few places that, a uh, few census blocks that fall off, um, but uh, it's still, you still have Hollister and uh, to a lesser degree San Juan Batista that have reasonably good access to that level of service, to that very minimal level of service that the FCC uh, benchmarks, um, where most, but most of the rest of the county does not. You step it up to the Netflix standard or the USDA standard, whoever you, whoever you trust the most, and uh, it, it starts to, uh, the map starts to fill in. Um, you have fewer places. You bring it up to the 100 megabit down, 20 megabit level that the Central Coast Broadband Commission, uh, cons uh, Consortium and the, uh, and uh, as I say, a growing number of our jurisdictions around the region are, are, are setting as a standard. When you get to that 100 down, 20 up level, um, you start to find that most of San Benito County, even Hollister and San Juan Batista, um, don't have consistent access to that level of service. The reason for that is principally due to your two incumbent um, internet service providers, major internet service providers, AT&T and Charter. Um, AT&T will provide fast service, will upgrade their plant to modern standards in neighborhoods where they think they're going to get a return on their investment. Um, Charter um, is in the process of upgrading its plant, but um, it's it lags behind Comcast by, I mean, if you want to put it in terms of years, maybe five or 10 years in some cases, but their, their, their infrastructure deployment is not keeping pace with, with California, with the average uh, pace of deployment in California. Typically, they only provide access to five megabits up. Upload speeds are important because that's what lets businesses communicate outward. That's what lets kids do their homework and interact with with the people they need to be able to interact with. Didn't used to be that way. Upload speeds didn't really matter um, so much, but now it's getting to the point where upload speeds and download speeds are equally important. Get to a gigabit and the last little bits are, are kind of filled in. Um, there's, I think, one census block there uh, off to the east of uh, Hollister. I don't know what's, what, what is there. If, uh, if anybody's interested, I can I can go find out, but uh, somebody there has gigabit service, but nobody else in the county does. <laughs> so how does that compare with the rest of California? Um, we went through the data for the whole state, all 700 some, 700,000 some odd census blocks, and um, a couple of million um, service reports, and crunched those, and found that the average Californian has access to two internet service providers, and one of those service providers is a telephone company like AT&T that provides, on the average, 30 megabits down, five megabits up, and that average Californian has access to a cable, uh, cable provider who provides at least 400 megabits down and 20 megabits up. In other words, a service that uh, meets or exceeds the, uh, the standard, the uh, 100 down, 20 up standard. That's what the average Californian has. So we said, okay, let's figure out how to m run a comparison across all the cities, counties, everywhere in California. We said, all right, that Californian average, we're gonna call that a C. D, barely passing, is that regional standard. If you have access to at least one provider, if you're home has access to at least one provider that offers that level of service, then your, your, uh, your infrastructure, your broadband infrastructure in your neighborhood is rated as D, barely passing. If you have access to, the, to you know, what I say the average Californian has, then, uh, then, uh, then it's a C. And then we set the F's and the A's and the B's. Um, if you don't have access to that minimum, um, that minimum 100 down, 20 up, it fails. Um, A's and B's are just better. Um, I won't, you know, and again, this is one of those geeky things that I'm happy to talk about more, but um, basically as you get to superior service up to A's where you have fiber to the home, gigabit service, um, infrastructure that is future-proof, 
probably for the next 50 or 100 years, we think, um, although I'm, it's always dangerous making those predictions, but fiber appears to be future-proof um, from any, any imaginable standpoint at this point. But um, those are the A's and the B's. So if you look at California, uh, you look up in Silicon Valley, you see a lot of blues and greens. Those are A's and B's. There's some yellow uh, C's in there, and there's, you get off into some of the surrounding areas. You get the red D's. But Silicon Valley has really good Internet infrastructure, really good broadband infrastructure. Los Angeles, it's mostly average, and, and that's actually not surprising. And anytime you do any, set anything on a statewide average, um, it usually tends to be Los Angeles that sets the average just because there's so many, so many people there. But uh, Los Angeles is pretty average. Watsonville, um, and Watsonville has pretty much the same, is in pretty much the same situation as Hollister. You had with uh, Charter and AT&T. Um, Watsonville mostly um, gets a D grade. So you look at what the grade is for San Benito County. And for the bulk of the county, it's, it's an F. Um, it's that gray areas, F or F minus. Um, you've got that light gray area down there around the Pinnacles. That's um, where Pinnacles Telephone Company uh, does provide service. Um, they, they do a good job um, given their resources and given the, uh, the area they serve. That's not to say if I, was, if I was living there, I would accept that as my end state, but it's, it's, uh, I, I, I do, do appreciate the work they do. But if you go up into, uh, into Hollister and San, Be and San Juan, um, you see some areas where the, you have that minimum standard that it rates a D, but most of the area is, uh, is uh, F as well, F or F minus. F minus, the dark gray being areas that have no reported service at all. This is just a kind of a report card. Um, it's just the, the numbers and the grades uh, that, uh, that go with uh, different, uh, different communities. Um, F plus isn't always so bad. Um, it usually means there's something there. Um, it's, uh, but uh, you start to get off into the, uh, into the further reaches of the county and it, uh, it, it drops down to completely unacceptable or completely unavailable. So the question becomes, what can you do about it? Um, one of the things you can do is start to build, as the Central Coast Broadband Consortium has tried to do over the past 10 years, is build a base of funding plans and partners. Um, that map there on the left was that grand plan we came up with back during the, uh, the stimulus program years. Um, it would have been a, a fiber ring throughout the three county region um, we went and we applied twice for it, and we didn't get the hundreds of million, hundred million dollars um, that we thought we were going to need to build it. But we figured if you don't ask, you don't get. So why don't we try that? Um, what we ended up with was something that was almost as good, which was a base of plans, um, a base of market research, a base of partners, both at the at the institutional, the government, and uh, corporate levels, to. Uh, to, to start to get something done. One of the things that we did was we supported, I'm, I'm going to give credit here to UC Santa Cruz, we supported a, an effort by UC Santa Cruz to get state funding to build a fiber line from uh, Santa Cruz down through Watsonville, Salinas, and on into Soledad. Uh, it's a 90-mile route. Um, the California Public Utilities Commission paid for it. It is now being used by companies, uh, by uh, uh, close to a dozen companies, to provide service. Uh, city of Watsonville has built out a fiber network that attaches to it, and uh, City of Salinas has uh, just uh, signed a contract to do the same. So it's it's those types of projects um, that you do bit by bit that we've seen uh, we've seen be successful. That um, that project comes no closer to San Benito County than Aromas. Um, we have some ideas about how to extend it from Aromas into Hollister at least, where Hollister has a, has a fiber network as well. So it's a joint county city uh, fiber network. And uh, if we can start to get connectivity in into Hollister, then we can start to build out in this area as we've built out in other areas. 
Other things you can do is look at policies. And this applies both to wireline and wireless internet service, wireless, wireline and wireless uh, telecommunications services. Dig once policies, what we call dig once policies, are a, are a big deal. Um, they're, uh, and in fact, San Benito, the county of San Benito um, has uh, a complete streets ordinance that incorporates a lot of these, uh, these policies. Um, and we, we've got specific dig once policies adopted in uh, some of the other cities around the region. These break down into about four different things. One is open trench notification. In other words, anytime somebody digs a trench to do a utility project, um, a notice goes out to anybody who would be interested. I mean, it could be PG&E or, or you know, the Water District or anybody. But um, we think specifically in terms of broadband companies, a notice goes out and says, hey, so there's going to be a trench opened up. Would you like to come in and share costs and install infrastructure? Um, that has worked. Uh, it, it, its utility isn't, it's not, the, it's not an ultimate solution to everything, but it does get things done. We've got prod, a fiber, fiber project in downtown Santa Cruz now that uh, is largely uh, due to uh, a dig once policy that the city of Santa Cruz has. City of Watsonville's um, fiber network, on the other hand, is due to another policy called Shadow Conduit, which is a public, uh, it's a public works type of project where the city will install conduit any time a trench is opened up. It can be, as with uh, the city of Watsonville, uh, with public works projects, every time the public works department digs a, digs a hole, not every time, but any time it makes sense to them, they install conduit. Um, just, this is just one of those, those stories I just like to, like to highlight. Um, a few years ago, Charter came to the city of, of uh, Watsonville and said, hey, you know that uh, free uh, internet uh, connectivity we've been giving the city, you know, from the airport all the way down the four miles to city hall and connected up all those buildings, we're gonna start charging you $150,000 a year for it. Um, city of Watsonville said, well, you know, to build fiber in those four miles, um, let's see, we've got three miles of conduit already installed. We can stitch that conduit together for another two or three hundred thousand dollars. No brainer, we're putting in a fiber network of our own, and that's what they did. Um, it was the result of them accumulating this inventory over years, but in the end it paid off. Um, City of Salinas has a similar, has a similar program. It's something that can be done not just with public works projects, but with any type of utility project. But it's, it's something that a city or a county has to, has to decide to do. And then a, another policy which is not as straightforward as some people sometimes put it, but it's, it, is, it is effective I in some cases, is what are called excavation moratoria. In other words, where you have a rule that says, okay, um, we're going to repave this street or we're gonna do major work on this street we're going to put out a notice to everybody who's interested, and they'll have one shot to install whatever it is they want installed there. And then if you can't exactly say they can't do anything for the next five or ten years, but you can um, put on requirements, enhanced remediation is kind of the buzzword, um, you can put requirements on that really makes it a lot more cost effective for them to do the work now than to, uh, than to do it later. Other types of, of, of policies, fiber deployment is one, you know, again, it's Hollister, Watsonville, and Salinas, and uh, Hollister being a, a partnership with the county. Um, those are the, uh, the three big success stories in our region. Um, 5G deployment, this is something I, I suspect you've gotten a lot of permit requests for 5G for mobile towers and probably have been told that this is going to bring 5G mobile broadband service that's going to solve everybody's problems. 5G is wonderful stuff. It is not the ultimate answer to everything. Um, it's going to solve the problems that mobile carriers have right now. And the biggest problem mobile carriers have right now is booming demand for data. Um, the average um, North American, U.S. and Canada, um, the, the average North American um, two years ago, used consumed seven gigabytes of mobile data a month. You know, watching Netflix, browsing the web, doing whatever it is, playing games. 
use cons consumes seven gigabytes of data a month. That is on a track to grow to 48 gigabytes a month in three years from now. And that's just the demand for data. And that's what mobile companies are trying to do is run fast enough to stay ahead of that demand. And that's why they're pushing so hard to get um, towers built, um, to build fiber out to those towers because every tower needs fiber. It's why they're trying to get access to streetlight poles and anything else that you know, is, is more than about 10 feet above the ground. Um, it's, what they're, it's what they're trying to do because they need to meet, the, meet that demand. Um, that's a great thing, we think, um, because you know, we're, our, we're a broadband consortium and we like more broadband. Um, but we always, it always has to be kind of balanced off, a couple of other, uh, off against a couple other things. One is it's not gonna replace wireline service. It's not gonna replace the cable or telephone line that comes into your house. It's not gonna replace the fiber um, line that comes in to the county or into a data center or, or into an internet service provider. Um, it is going to supplement all those. It's gonna use all that capacity, um, but it's not going to replace it. So it's, it's, going to be, it's gonna be good stuff, but it's not, gonna, it's not gonna fix everything. The other thing is, it is an urban, largely an urban service, 5G is. They'll be, all the, all the carriers are gonna be upgrading their 4G service, their LTE service, whatever, whatever it is they call it in the market place, but um, they're not going to be deploying 5G for the most part in rural areas. Um, they'll use it as a gap filler in some places, um, but for the most part, it is going to be deployed in cities and su suburbs where people are dense, users are dense, and most importantly, money is dense because that's what, that's what drives our capital spending plans. Um, 5G is about two things. It's about technology and it's about something that's called densification. The technology, 5G technology is 10 years newer than 4G technology, which was 10 years newer than 3G and you know, so on. 5G is better than 4G. The technology is great and as they go, they're going to start to replace 5G, 4G equipment with 5G over the next 10 years. But what 5G is really about is what they call densification, which means going from one big tower that might serve several square miles to maybe 10 or 100 small cell sites, maybe you know, on street lights or something, something similar, going, from going to like 10 or 100 of those in a square mile. That's how you get more broadband. You just densify your network. And the money to do that is only, you're only gonna find the money to do that in areas where there's revenue. So it's, it's not going to be, it's not gonna be rural areas. You will see improvements in rural areas, but it's not going to be on the scale that you're gonna see in other, in, uh, in other areas. There's also other types of things you can do, advocacy, access, and adoption. Um, just by, and what that all means is get involved. And that's something the CCBC has been doing for the last, like I say, 25 years, but uh, hardcore the last 12. So if you have any questions or anything I can address, I'm here to, I'm here for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Commissioner, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, through, the, through the chair, I'd just like to thank you for the presentation. And I would like to see the conversation continue, hopefully with the support and participation of the RMA and also loop in the CAO's office and the Board of Supervisors. So we're not just discussing it, that we're actually getting something done in the very near future as opposed to 10 or 15 or 20 years out. Uh, get, a, get, a, get away from the old standards and, and start moving forward uh, because the, the county definitely needs to catch up to modern times, especially being so close to Silicon Valley. Uh, we need to get our internet up to speed and a uh, plan for bringing technology companies to the county because we need the employers here. We cannot continue having 12,000 people a day commute to Silicon Valley. It's just, it's just not something we can continue to do or the quality of life will deteriorate. That was the thinking in Santa Cruz 10 years ago, which is why um, folks in Santa Cruz pushed so hard to get those fiber lines built. Um, I don't know that the traffic on 17 is, is much better these days, 
but it, it is going in both directions now. <laughs> so I, I guess that's, uh, that's something of an improvement. Yes. Any more questions? No, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Can we? Uh, yeah. That are fiber. Uh, they're white and they have an orange cap on top. Stick out of the ground. Oh yeah, that, the, the 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 route markers. Yes. Right. Yes. And are those intended for towers to come or? In some cases, yes. Um, there's, uh, I mean, for example, you go down Highway 25 down to. Uh, down to the fairgrounds, and you have uh, you have a mobile site down there. That's the type of facility that uh, the companies over time are going to be upgrading. There's public safety money that's being spent, a lot of public safety money that's being spent by the federal government to uh, upgrade uh, upgrade com communications for first responders, and and that's part of what it's going to be supporting too. Um, the the you know it's. I wish I had a magic answer for you, if, but I guess if I did, I'd be out of a job. Um, the, um, the, what you can do is encourage local businesses and local institutions, local agencies to insist on the best. Um, when providers come to you and say, we want X, Y, and Z, say, okay, but ask not what your county can do for you, but what you can do for your county. And um, that's, that's part of it. The other is, is to start thinking more broadly about broadband as a utility. Um, it's, it's something that is very basic. It's not necessarily something that a, that a government agency has to provide, although some do, um, but it is a utility that needs to be taken into account um, when development is planned, um, when, uh, when uh, businesses expand, and these are all, it, it's, it's a question that should be on that, that checklist of things. I mean, I sat through the public hearing er, earlier today when you were looking at, you know, Rule 20 relocation of, of a utility line. That's broadband too. Um, and it's in a, you know, looking at, at pole routes, that's on your checklist of things. Broadband, whether it's pole or underground, that's something I think that can be on your checklist of things too as you're starting to build that infrastructure over time to, uh, to uh, get what you need. I mean, it, it's great if somebody would just swoop down and it would have been wonderful if we'd have gotten the $100 million or so 10 years ago, but uh, I don't think that's ever gonna happen again. So we, we're focusing on trying to do, you know, do it piece by piece, taking targets of opportunity where we can. Thank you. Is there any, uh I thought the future was we're going to have all this stuff beamed down to us from satellites. Oh, I love that. I was so just, yeah. ver versus the hard wire, you know, where you've got lay cable for 125 miles in the ground. What about satellite technology and base stations and stuff? Satellites are great. I was in the satellite industry for 20 years. Um, it's uh, but a satellite is the absolutely most expensive way to get bandwidth anywhere. Um, Two-way bandwidth anywhere. It's 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 dead cheap if what you're trying to do is get one television signal to a whole continent, because it's just one bird up in the sky and it it sees everything. That's how Directv and Dish work. It's dead cheap when you look at it that way. But when you're trying to to talk back and forth to it, it's very expensive because now you've got what amounts to a small cell site that is um, maybe couple hundred miles up or maybe 22,000 miles up uh, above above the earth. Either way, if it breaks, you can't fix it. <laughs> um, it's limited. <laughs> it's, Don't it, fix that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's limited by power. It's, it's limited by the distance um, in a lot of cases. Um, and, and what it is, I mean, the, the systems that are being proposed are, are great. I mean, they're, they're kind of reboots of, of things that we were working on 20 years ago. Um, What's changed over time is just simply the demand for broadband. Um, so the satellite systems are going to address those what we call edge cases, you know, those those exceptions to exceptions. 
um, where you've got, you know, you've got a, a, well, ships out in the ocean, for example, or, or a, an oil company out in the desert where they need huge amounts of bandwidth someplace where there, there just isn't anything at all. Satellites are great for that, but it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. There's also money, there's also the money there to pay for it. Um, it's not going to replace cell towers. And it's not going to replace the, uh, the wires that go into your house. My other question was on your heat maps. Yes. You showed a point east of Hollister that was at the 1,000. It has a gigabit. I, yeah. 1,000 gigabit and with the upload. And what I don't understand is if the technology is getting there, how come there's not this pathway back to the point of connection all along that's at the 1,000 megabit rate? How is it that it just appeared right there and we can't spoke into it and expand that? This, this, is, this is why I say interact, interact constructively and uh, affirmatively with, uh, with your internet service providers. What you're seeing is, in effect, a freeway with no off-ramps. Somebody's built a freeway out there to that point out there and hasn't built any off-ramps. So, is it? It's at RJR Recycling. I have no idea. Where <laughs> <it is>. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a Johnson landfill. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no reason. There's no reason you can't. You know, if if they manage to get it out there, I, I mean, without knowing how they're doing it, the typical way of doing it is you've got fiber going out there, um, but they're not using that fiber um, except to feed. Maybe, maybe to feed some of their interne intermediate points. They're not using that fiber um, as, you know, as fully as they could. So. And AT&T is very bad service here. Uh, it's not the first time I've heard that. that. <laughs> the area, we're about the county and all that, but where we're at, I got rid of AT&T. Yeah, my, my service AT &T, kept I dropping. get no service just inside my office yeah. wall next to the window. Mm -hmm. And once they put the heating, the insulation on the window for cost savings mm. wiped it <laughs> i used to have like one bar now it's like yeah no eighteen service is bad yep you got to live by its cell tower <coughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you so much mm. for coming down Stephen. uh mm -hmm. mr bloom thank you very much thank you what's the next item of discussion oh, huh Hmm. Sure. Okay. Does gentleman have a speaker card? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just haven't walked up here yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> John Freeman of San Juan Batista. Uh, just following up on what Steve said, I think the really important thing to remember is in your 2015 general plan, you have an entire section on the Dig Once policy. It might be a little dated now. You might want to go back and maybe update it to those other items that he showed on the slide. The, the, you know, I think your dig once is mostly the open trench, and um, segue. I'm listening. I said no. It's a great segue. <laughs> yeah. For us, sir. And so, um, I, I, I'm, for, I'm forgetting what the other names were, but uh, you, you know what I mean. Just update it a little bit, and I think that that. Because that's planning, and that's what you guys do. And, and that's planning for business development. And that's planning for the future for San Benito County. Thank you. Thank you. Any more speakers? No. All right. So number seven, discussion of plan division, staff and general plan. Yeah, well, well, thank you, uh, Chairman. We're... Um, quite a bit of materials I put in the packet. Were, were several of you or most of you able to kind of thumb through it a little bit, get a, get good. a, get a feel for it? Mm -hmm. So since it is a discussion item and I've already shared a lot of words with you, I don't want to necessarily rehash everything or present it, but the several attachments that are with that outline of the division discussion, the discussion of planning, staffing, budgeting, and general plan, because at one point you, you saw the effort where I was going to go out to a, an RFP and see what consultant would bid and what the price would be to help do our implementation for us. 
and it just kind of fell on deaf ears, if you remember, or didn't get up. We were at uh, consultant fatigue, or you know, where are we going to pull another two hundred thousand dollars more for the general plan? And so I gave a little editorial on that, and then you see where I reloaded with the uh, <coughs> a subsequent. RMA director for the ideal budget. And that's the, the attachment you have that's in blue here where this was a draft. I, I didn't massage it much since it was in my computer before giving to you. But that um, from my staff report has the bullets that are outlined on this page that has a little graphic. So the, the blue spreadsheet includes uh, uh, my estimate, my ideal estimate of staffing levels, some of the workload expectations, new contracts, expected purchases, basically the business of the planning department and the, and the things we need to do. And more than the, the barn proposal or a subdivision or a new commercial proposal is we have to put systems in place and fix codes to be consistent with state law or we've implemented a general plan that says, county, make it easier for businesses to invest. Write a new, write a new ordinance. And, and also administrative things and, and fix broken things. And so I could go through some of that. But as you see, what I did was, in, since we it kind of fell on deaf ears or the cutting room floor in the budget time that we would pay for outside consultants to prepare um, consultant contracts, excuse me, com implementation of the general plan. What I tried was, hey, let's, let's hire two advanced planners, two planners that write codes. You know, in full-time equivalent, that's uh, 2,080 hours a piece. You know, if we had two of them, 4,000 hours. Um, and if we had them as staff, then Maybe their professionalism and their experience could rub off on the other staff, as well as the other way around is if they're writing an ordinance helping us implement wine and hospitality provisions on Sienega Road, they could benefit by us that are already here in the trenches and know the flavor and the character of Sienega Road so that that implementation ordinance is uh, more hand in glove with the county. Um, so I won't go into too much, but I just, I remember back when cell towers and cellular stuff was um, brand new. If you could pass, take, take one of these, please. Sure. It was brand new. And the thing that frustrated the cell tower company a lot was not whether we told them to have it look like a cactus or a pink tree, which is expensive, but what frustrated the, the, the cellular company is when they're like, we don't know what we want. We're going to figure it out. We're going to think about it. We, we haven't written the implementation yet. If they could step up and see on your plan or in your county that, hey, this county wants the cell towers to be disguised and to look like pine trees. And what they do is they say, here's my pine tree proposal that I think has approval. And they know that they can get in and out of the process in, in two months and groundbreak and have their investment. And so even if we have a stamp that <laughs> rather expensive, you might say, versus just a cell tower, since it was a known and fixed environment that they could operate in, it was waters they could swim in for investment. Such is much of the economic implementation elements that are here. And so I've given you a lot to, to speak about that you can hear, and you know my opinion, where I kind of recommend two uh, planners. <coughs> but the, this attachment that you have is directly, these are excerpts right from the general plan. Mm -hmm. And it was our obligations of phasing from 2015 to 2017 those implementation ordinances so that business and entities would know what we meant about the general plan. And we could have done commercial nodes back then. You know, so folks knew to step up right then. And it wasn't this, oh, you need a zone change too now. Right? We would have already had the ordinances in place. And, and 
we could have, like, let's be facetious for a moment with the, zone ch with the commercial nodes. You know, if you make it look like a farmstead, then you've got a good shot of getting that one approved. You know, if you make it look like a pink ship on the horizon, not so good because our we already thought through it. We want it to look like a farm. And so we could have done those things. Um, and so if we do have staff in the department, then we don't have to go back for contract amendments if we need them to change course for a little bit. Maybe all of a sudden broadband just rises to the top and we need someone to clear their desk and for two weeks straight find the best ordinance and the financing mechanisms to provide broadband. And we would have that staff person. So with that, I'm going to kind of step down and let you guide the conversation as you wish because um, I have said a lot with these materials. What I have passed in front of you, these exhibits, was even back in 2015 when the general plan was fresh. Um, Val, uh, Commissioner Eglin, what's it, is it to Valerie? It's to, it's oh, to Mar Marge. Marge uh, Barrios. Marge. All right. And she had asked the consultant who had finished the general plan, he's like, well, what are, the, what are our next steps at implementation? What are those things we should do? And she goes, well, here's a hot list. And that's what that is. And it's four, four and a half years now, and only several of them have been implemented. The housing element was completed about the same time. And I think um, the, uh, Mr. Starbuck, who's been hired as an economic development coordinator, but yet it's, I never hear it in the context of a general plan. I hear there's this economic development coordinator and he's going to all these meetings and everything, but I've never met with him. I don't know what extension of the general plan is, but the general plan speaks to that a lot. Um, so anyway, there is a suggestion even four years ago about the prioritization of some of the implementation measures. And, and the big one in there is, you know, consistency with laws. That's big. But between all the attrition and the changeover, and, you know, I'm on my fourth RMA director myself, and I've only been here since April of 2017. And, you know, you get different amounts of traction with different commissioners, uh, different directors. Maybe now is the time with different staff members. And I got a call the other day from Mr. Pierce and just remembered the, you know, just the, how the, the changes in the planning commission themselves and what you're engaged in and what you're doing. So I'm going to hush, put it back to the chair and I'll be here for any questions. But I think Commissioner Gibson and, and Sharon, do you guys want to just discuss in yourself on how to implement general plan or sit with your supervisors for budgetary reasons? Go ahead. Through the chair. Uh, I wanted to thank Mr. Kennison Brown for the information and the presentation. I think that uh, personally I'd like to see the two staff hired tomorrow. That's obviously not possible. But I would like to see uh, or hear updates uh, to make sure that we're on track to get these people hired for the next fiscal year and not end up two or three fiscal years down the road. Um, we're at a point where our zoning is not in compliance with the general plan and I think that it's in the best interest of the county that we get that done sooner rather than later. And this is part of it. And I just want to know <laughs> where we are in the process as far as working with the CAO's office and the board and, and just to get updates on occasion as, as this process is being worked out so that we don't miss the next year that would be a tragedy and uh, that that's my concern that we, we don't let another year go by without filling these positions and getting the general plan implemented and getting uh, our commercial non-existent commercial house in order basically and that ties in with the broadband that we we have conversations and get that infrastructure in place so that we don't have 12,000 people a day on Highway 25. Well, I think that's a great discussion point amongst yourselves. How do you get traction in the budgetary process? How does one reveal the value in implementing these general plans? Um, maybe it's an expense today, but if the tax base goes up and the investment environment is more secure and known, it'll pay for itself. It's 
kind of, I wanted to demonstrate here that uh, I've made efforts. I've, I've been the, for fun words, the chicken little and tried a couple times. Uh, but this needs traction elsewhere. It'll, it'll, know, it'll at find some, it. At some high places. Yeah. You know, um, <coughs> if the value's not seen in it, you know, it's just that, oh my gosh, you know, general plan is just that wordy stuff and it holds my door open when the wind wants to slam my door versus a real live active document. Um, <coughs> Mike. I not the discussion wasn't with me. I wanted to share it with you. Yes, you guys, it, it, you, it'll you be pursued. Talking for it'll you. be pursued. We just need the the RMA staff and director to assist with getting the CAO's office and the board to see the light. I suppose, educated. For lack of a better term, that this needs to happen sooner rather than later, or it's to the detriment of the county. And and with the help of of staff and yourself, outlining the need the conversation will happen shortly do you, do you my think expectation the, material, the materials i presented would facilitate conversations you could have with yes. groups or yes. even the person that appointed you correct the mm -hmm. conversations will happen shortly it's just nice to have this in a forum that everybody can can see it and understand it is the tone okay or did i come off preachy or or no. you can raise it up a little mm. Be but more aggressive. Uh, oh. what, do you, what do you mean? Be more aggressive. That's what you out, out on the plank with the target on my back. <laughs> hey. The guy who's rocking the boat, or the guy that yells the loudest gets hurt. Huh. And the and the the directors on board, I'm assuming with the concept, because it's important to have the director as well. Yeah, yeah. that's nice. A and your staff along with it too. Mm -hmm. It's always good. Yeah, you have to present a united front with reasoning to say look he's doing this i'm doing that they're doing this this is how much we're getting done and this is what the <coughs> cost difference would be between hiring two new guys and hiring a uh a bunch of consultants what's w the cost the difference fiscal process get it underway again wasn't this right after the first yes right because it's the last six months of the existing fiscal and the lead up to the new um, so if the graph is so in earnest in March, yeah. and, al and also get rid of the part timers, get rid of the part time people that work in planning, they don't produce any work because they're not there 100. percent We've had an addition of there's probably six or seven new bodies that are in the planning department right now yeah. that are giving us bandwidth. Um, mm -hmm. Don't quite know how they're being paid. I think it's a combination of volunteers and others right now. Mm -hmm. Because I know you have some planners that just come in f a couple of days a week. That don't cut the muster when you need questions answered. My opinion is as, as a business owner, I get rid of all part-timers because that's not the real job. I know that the union is more receptive to a full union yeah. stride, 40-hour mm -hmm. week. 40-hour week. But if you remember one of the little snippets I had in there uh, after... I think it was once Mr. Girton came on and the Walgren and Perlin had moved on, is I was able to hire two assistant planners. Uh, still have one of those and one moved away and I've hired a, a new one since. You guys, Ariel Goodspeed. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did do a recruitment out for a senior planner. And we didn't have a pay rate that attracted them out of Santa Cruz or Monterey or the Bay Area or anyway, and so that recruitment went flat. And so this whole thing, the union-wise and <coughs> rate study matters. You know, it's just been hard for a long time to get, you know, the building official and others. So there's so many interrelated aspects of, well, how do you, how do you, how do you shed your temporary staff is because you've made the position attractive enough for someone to want to work full time here. And that's. Am, excuse mm. me. Am I understanding that uh, the planner, you've got to have somebody who knows California law or could you get a, someone from Wisconsin who would like to see sunshine? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that works. <laughs> yeah, no, that works real good. 
I, I would have to say sequa <laughs> is an acquired taste, <laughs> but uh, the basic tenets of planning, of uh, you know, general plan with goals, policies, and objectives. Um, you know, it goes way back to you know military days before it was even used in, in municipal practice. So I, I would I would say that I mean they've got these headhunters I believe they're called that uh, uh, seek even even if one advertised in far-reaching places where I, I disagree. No? You disagree? Why? Yes. Because you need someone that knows California or knows the laws here. Uh, we had a director from out of, from Jersey. It don't cut it. Oh, that's right. No, that don't cut it. His ideas are totally different than what the ideas here in California are. Through you, need, you know, and another thing too that I know the county, the pay rate's not there. Yeah, I was gonna that's say a, that's the biggest that's issue. That's the biggest, the like biggest barrier here is just uh, the resources. So, so through, through the through the chair, the the study should be back or back soon. The pay rate study from my understanding, and that hopefully will reflect a salary that will get us qualified people. Um, it's just a matter of having the, Data. the RMA staff and director behind the push because the push will be coming right after Christmas and the New Year's over to get this done. Um, so just be, just be prepared to uh, answer the questions when they come. Because I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that this gets accomplished for the July 1st fiscal year. Let me ask one more question. Uh, the strategic plan that was done not long ago, uh, it, it indicated that uh, steps were to be made for compliance with the general plan. Isn't that part of it? County strategic plan. County was strategic made, plan right? of, um, and I think it's, it's not part of my lexicon. Been presented to me, something I use every day, or know that it's a priority of administrating the administration or my RMA director. I don't know that we refer to it. I'm okay. sorry. When and when? And what about the meeting tomorrow? That's interdepartmental. Are you part of that? Yes, I. I when the department was down to zero, I had to recreate these institutions from scratch and get to know these people and come in just so we could get work done. And that's what, so it's more project oriented um, versus, um, you know, us doing a budget preparation. Um, are you, you, you thinking of it as a constructive form for, for something? I think everything should be out for availability. You know, if <coughs> if something can be pushed at that meeting, uh, any way that communication then can be had. Yeah. Um, you know, I what I'm not feeling here is a strong leadership from somebody, and I don't know if that's from your body or if it needs to be from this building or if it needs to be from one of the elected. Um, I'm a technician in, in the trenches, kind of doing the mechanics of knowing where the laws are and how to review a project or, <coughs> you know, even just illustrating that most communities have an advanced planning section in addition to their current planning section that keeps counties and cities up to date with changing laws and helps them implement, implement new ordinances when they need to. And we don't have that right now. Um, yeah, you know, how to have a, <coughs> a good, constructive, well-rounded conversation where folks are on board at the uh, decision-making level or the, the administrative levels. Nope. You, you, you kind of hear what I'm, it's not for me to speak for Cor me. Correct. to no. my superiors and tell them what to do. Yes. I can bring information and give them the best of advice. And as you've seen, some things haven't gotten off the desk. Correct. And also, um, you know, one of the wonderful things right now that 
is happening with uh, Mr. Mavriginis is he's willing to bring in new bodies and put a little money in things and, and, and spend some money. And evidently, the, even the board met him and found different ways to find money for some potholes and some road repairs. So there is you know, a little blossoming and a little blooming right now. And that's a different direction than I've had in, in, in previous directors, where actually the department just had fallen apart and we had to build it up from scratch. And, um, you know, and actually some of the stuff I've been able to do was recent when we hired the staff services specialist, Megan Stevens, who was here. And great, as I pulled down the, my, you know, 25 things on my to-do list and say, here, I need to address these systems and these broken things and get people under contract and help me with that. And uh, it was great. It got traction. It had bandwidth. It had some staff. She's since moved on. <coughs> and... And and uh, I don't have a, a person refilling that seat <coughs> immediately, and that's uh, an administrative level. That oh, we can't let that seat go vacant too long. Uh, rest assured, the conversation will continue soon. So, so just know that I'm always trying to be respectful, and I'm an information provider. I can demonstrate the need, but. Um, you know, if I'm the only one crying foul in the chicken, I'm the one that's going to get my head cut off, yeah. especially if it's counter to someone else that might say, well, here's my idea on economic development. Right. Well, great. Let, let's put it down. Let's all, let's all carry that baton and go with that torch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. So here, a motion for adjourn. Would I? I? Motion to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, too. Aye. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everyone. So, do you want to wait here or do you want to? Okay. Are you going to that meeting tomorrow?